here at all. So, <laughs> um, special thanks to Dr. Alan Berger. Uh, I, you know, I, I was in AA for about uh, 18 months when I got connected with Alan, and um, the way he was talking about things just made sense. It was like, you know, I got a lot of realizations from my 12-step meetings, my AA meetings, and I, and I started connecting with people and understanding more about myself. And, and when I met Alan and I did his two-year Gestalt um, training, graduated from that, I'm not helping out with another one, um, I really just got extra clarity. So I'm kind of, a lot of the stuff that you're going to be hearing is, is my, me tweaking it and putting my own little signature on a lot of stuff that I learned with Alan. So if you get a chance to talk at any time, I encourage you to do that. So, and really it started with me, uh, I was helping Alan out and I got one of his CDs and then the uh, therapeutic value of the 12 steps, he talks about, he kind of sets it up a little bit and what he says in that CD is, there's a certain setup in our culture that heads us in the direction of being addicts. There is, in my opinion, a conspiracy against the true self. And when I heard that, I just, I knew there was something to that because when I got, and I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, it's five years, I'm, I'm Almost five years sober. Be five years sober, sober this summer, and um, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, one of the things that I became very um, uh, aware of when I got into AA that I was wrong about a lot of things. I mean, wow! I was the, the direction I was heading, the path I was taking, and and I and, and then somehow I look outside myself and I connect to things like. I need a better car, you know. I need a hotter girlfriend. I need, you know, all these things, and and I'm and then I'm like, so it, it wasn't just me. It was something about the environment I was living in that was setting me up for this. So when he said that, I really connected to it. So just to give you a, a kind of an understanding, like an attitude, I'd love you to cultivate in, in, in listening and watching my presentation. So I don't know if you know this, but if I take a piano and I hammer down on a G, uh, that'd be like a D note, right? And I have a guitar right next to that piano that D note's gonna vibrate without even touching it. So that's kind of an analogy for an attitude I'd, I'd love you to cultivate as you're listening to me because I truly believe that the truth is within you, it's within me, and on some level, what I love about uh, recovery, what I love about therapy, what I love about all, all the stuff, is that when I know, I know, and it, and it resonates with me deep down within. So it's so just a, something that I can present to you. Uh, and we're gonna move on for that. So the goals of my presentation is to explore the origin and manifestation of what we call the false self. And I, I think of it as the self that's referred to in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the third step prayer. You know, when I heard that third step prayer, relieve me of the bondage of self, I got it. I got the bondage of self in spades and I need to be rid of that. I gotta figure that out. So that's the, uh, the self I'm talking about. I'm also gonna illustrate how family dynamics and cultural forces play a significant role in uh, human growth and actualization real and or false self, and also show how the principles of the sex steps work to counteract, counteract neurotic solutions, allowing for authentic self-realizations. So I've done this before. I've been told I go a little too fast, so I'm going to try to slow it down. And so at the end, I might, I might race through a couple things, but I'm going to try to stay. So I don't know how many steps we're going to get into, but I really want to, I want to stay with you, and I want to stay uh, relevant to the, to the uh, presentation. So human development. So. Karen Horney, if you ever get a chance to read this book, it is phenomenal. Um, it, the book is called Neurosis in Human Dro uh, Growth, The Struggle Towards Self-Realization. And she is a neo-Freudist, she's a psychoanalyst, and what she talks about is you need not, in fact, cannot teach an acorn to grow into an oak tree, but when given a chance, its intrinsic potentialities will develop. Similarly, human indiv a, a human individual given a chance will develop along the unique and, and the live forces of his real self. So what I'm going to talk to, to you about is how our concept of value, how we determine value, is essential to, what, to where I go in terms of do I go acorn to oak tree, you know, intrinsically, organically, or do I go in some different direction, okay? Hold on a sec. And uh, so what I, de I define value as importance, worth, and usefulness. The top three were actually uh, out of Webster's. I added significance because I think on some level just being significant. I want to be significant and almost as much as I can in my life. And I think that leans on a little bit what Maria was talking about, wanting to be useful, wanting to be happy. I, you know, I think all of us, that's innate. We want to be that way. We want to find that. So Karen Horney also says, but through a, a, a variety of adverse influences, a child may not be permitted to grow according to his individual needs and, potent, uh, and possibilities. So what I'm also going to be talking a lot about is the, the concept of an introjection. So what is an introjection? 
An introjection is an unconscious adoption of external ideas or attitudes. Another way of looking at it is an undigested, uncritically assessed attitude, a way of acting, feeling, or, and evaluating that are swallowed whole often by primary caretakers. A lot of times when I'm trying to work with a client to get them to understand the, um, the, the, the idea of an introjection is I'll take a pillow and I'll say uh, something like, uh, you, do you like that shirt that you're wearing? And, you know, or I pick something that they like about themselves. You know, yeah, I like this shirt. And, I, and I'll take a pillow and I'll say, well, this pillow is me not liking your shirt. And then I'll say, now I want you to do an experiment. I lean into the experiment because this is not reality, but I'm trying to get them to see what's going on. I'll throw them the pillow. Now I said, I want you to squeeze that. And I want you to say, God, I hate my shirt. You know, and I would say, what just happened right there? And, and, and usually the client will have an understanding of, oh, okay, well, initially I thought my, my shirt was okay. You told me that. Now all of a sudden I believe my shirt's terrible. That, that would be, a lot of times, you know, we do that and that's, that's an interjection. So that's the simplest way to, to connect with a client to do that. I, like Alan, like to bring everything into an experiment if I can. So, um, so what we're going to talk about is how the interjections we get in our families and in culture, in our culture, kind of determine where we head on this path in terms of false self, real self. So, um, here we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of do a little diagram uh, of, of how, what this looks like. <laughs> so initially we start as an acorn, right? You know, we're uh, planting the ground. Now if you look at an acorn, an acorn needs enough space, it needs sunlight, it needs water, it needs nutrients, it needs a lot of things, but if it gets everything it needs, excuse me, if it gets everything it needs, it turns into the oak tree. That's not an oak tree, but an oak tree is too big. So I just, <laughs> but it turns into an oak tree, okay? So, so notice, notice the squiggly line. So the squiggly line, the squiggly line represents the, all the different possibilities that I need. I need all different possibilities. And if I get what I need, which is part of the, you know, developing the possibilities I have, then I can spontaneously meet the environment, the situation, the circumstance. I can spontaneously meet that because it's wired into me. Because as an acorn turns into an oak tree, so can I grow along the, uh, the lines of my intrinsic possibilities. So what happens, and this is what Karen Horn and I talks about in her book, is we go on a search for glory. So we don't get some stuff, you know, like, a, like the acorn doesn't get water or whatever. We don't get the love. We don't get, we're not seen in our family. We're not heard in our family. And what happens is, and notice the straight line, because what happens is, is all these possibilities below us really don't become options for us anymore. And, what, and then what, 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 what cements that in place is what Karen Hornet calls the tyranny of the shoulds. So all of a sudden, I should be this. I should be that. For, this, for me, I should be cool at all times. There is no time for me to be uncool ever. I could have told you that when I was like eight, all right? So I got to be cool all times and I should be cool. And this is the idealized self. And, this, and what happens is, is this develops a pride system, right? I reward myself when I'm shooting and I'm winning, right? I should do this, I'm doing it great, right? But what, uh, there's, there's a flip side to that coin. And that's the, basically the despise self. And the this, despise this self basically says that I skip through all of these op options, and all of these gray area situations, right? Making a mistake, that's okay, it's part of life. Uh-uh, can't make a mistake, I hate myself, despise self, right? And then what comes in is self-hatred, shame. And I think this, I, I don't think any of us are trying to hate ourselves. I don't think, I really don't. I think most of us, if not all of us, have some ideal. Even if it's just, I don't want to feel this way. Boom, I'm going to use something, right? So, this is a true self, false self model. And, uh, and notice, these rigid lines are comp represent compulsivity. I compulsively have to be this. And, and I compulsively have to hate myself when I'm not. So the compulsivity and the, and the rigidity is wired into that. And I feel like, you know, when it says in the book, big book, we are the victims of a delusion that we can wrest satisfaction out of this world if we only manage well, that's what he's talking about. So now I'm in a delusional phase. So for me to continue this like total quest to be cool at all times, I needed to be drunk a lot, okay? Because, because I needed to be able to talk to any and every female, any and everywhere I went, and in order to do that, I had to be about six or seven deep, and then other stuff got involved. So, so basically, this is how I got caught up in my addiction. And then what I think the next thing happens is we get depressed because for me, and I'll tell you a little bit about what happened to me, but I couldn't pull it off. I couldn't pull it off. The, the drinking didn't work anymore. I, I couldn't get it with the other stuff as well. So now I'm so depressed. I'm so, so full of self-hate that boom, now I got more addiction. So now I'm not drinking or using to feel any sort of like great, grandiose ideal. I'm just drinking using to escape the pain. So this is really how I see the true self, false self model. So 
Now we're going to talk about what happens in early childhood, because I think this starts way before we start drinking and using. So this, uh, uh, Alan learned this from Dr. Walter Kempler, and then Alan has since talked about it, so I, he uses it in the Emotional Sobriety Workshop. I highly recommend that. So really, um, so I want you to imagine, this is Jenny, right? And Jenny goes to school, she's in kindergarten, maybe preschool, and she, she just made a painting. She's super excited about the painting. Jenny comes home and she says, Mom, look at my painting, right? And what does Mom say? Now, I really want you to check in and see, because if I, I want to be realistic. If I'm not being, that's cool. But check and see if you think this would be a realistic reaction to an American mother. Wow, that painting is so amazing. I am so happy to see that painting. Wow, you must be the most amazing and awesome painter in the kindergarten. You're the number one top Hey, honey, number one painter, top painter in the kindergarten, right? And oh, let's put that on the refrigerator. Honey, look at your painting. It's amazing, right? Well, what just happened there? To me, the process of determining value just became introjected. And what I mean by that is now that little girl on some level feels my value is determined by other people. The more important the person is, the more that person has an influence on my value. Now, how important is a parent when you're four or five years old, right? And I, and I presented this to a buddy who's 44 years old and can't really get out of these dysfunctional relationships where women are like, like so darn important. And he says, I'm still doing that, uh, you know, because, he, you know, and, he's, and he said it at about 10 years old, he more, it went from, from mom to some other people, right? So the second thing is my value is how I compare to other people. And if I want extreme value, by golly, I'm going to be better than everybody else. And the other thing that I think is interjected is my value is in, in, in the end result and or the final product. I enter into the results business, as they say, in recovery. My value is on that refrigerator, all right? If there's anything I would ask you to hopefully grasp from this presentation, that's that. Because this is, is the bane of my existence, getting in recovery. We'll talk about that in a second. So what just happened there? The process, the interjected process, uh, interjected process creates contingent value. So now, my value is totally contingent upon people validate me. Me becoming a certain ideal, which means I gotta put a certain ideal on other people. I gotta show to myself, I gotta should you too. And then arriving at a, a, a satisfactory result. And the other thing is, it comes through my imagination, which Fritz Perls calls the demilitarized zone of awareness. There, there's really no rules up there, you know, if I don't put them in place, right? So I have this client, he struggles from uh, severe social anxiety. So we did a little experimental exercise, he dialogues his anxiety. And what he said was, is that someone says, hey, we're going to go hang around with a group of people. So he imagines the group of people. Oh my gosh. And then he imagines, he doesn't realize this, but we kind of work with it. He imagines, oh my gosh, everybody has to like me for me to be okay. Not just a few. Everybody. And then he also imagines, that's kind of impossible. Not everybody can like me. Oh crap, you know, I can't do it anymore. And he's panicked and he, can't, and he hasn't even stepped one foot towards the group, right? Because he's idealized himself in his imagination and he's shamed himself in his imagination as well. And I do this all the time and I think a lot of people do as well. So just to be aware that all this stuff can happen, right? Smack in my imagination, what Karen Hornay says, and she's talking about that what happens is we imbue our imagination with some sort of like sense of self. She calls it, there's only, there is only one way in which he, the neurotic, can seem to fulfill them, and she's talking about the needs not fulfilled in early childhood, and seem to fulfill them all in one stroke, and that's through imagination. So now I'm imagining all the time, and I'm trying to be my imagination. I'm trying to uh, what, you know, idealize or um, actualize my imagination. So pathological problems ensue. My value is determined by other people. Now I'm dependent. I'm dependent on you to tell me how amazing I am so I can experience my own value. You know, and uh, you know, low self-esteem, because that's an impossibility. Not everybody's gonna tell me how amazing I am all the time. So I'm gonna have low self-esteem. I'm gonna resent you because you don't tell me how amazing I am. <laughs> and I'm gonna have severe relationship issues because like Alan says in a lot of his talks, a healthy relationship is an eye to thou. It's where I'm as important as my partner and my partner is as just as important as me. Well, if my partner is uber important and I'm not important, I'm going to be really comp compulsively dependent on them. So, moving on, you know, um, Fritz Perls, uh, as many of you know, he's the founder of Gestalt Therapy. Uh, as I said, I'm a Gestalt therapist. He's really brilliant with his insights. Our dependency makes slaves out of us, especially if this dependency is a dependency of our self-esteem. If you need encouragement, praise, pats on the back from everybody, then you make everybody your judge. So that's what happens when we really interject this deal. 
So I want to uh, show you a clip. This is a commercial, a recent one. You've probably uh, seen it. So just what we just said about important people, interjection, and that affecting my value. Think about that and watch this commercial. <laughs> Think about his sense of self before the, when the commercial starts and how it grows. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm not that bad. <laughs> so what they don't tell you in the commercial is, is that he finally realizes that all those girls are looking at the car, not him, and he goes to a bar and he gets wasted. So they don't, <laughs> they don't tell you that in the commercial. <laughs> they don't tell you that, right? But I think that's a, that commercial is such a... It's, to me, it's genius, because most commercials, the guy's in the car. And somehow they fuse the two together. But the, the two are not together. I am not the thing. I am not the object. I'm actually, like, separate from it, and somehow the object makes me better. You know, so I think, and, and of course, and then how do they make that happen? They put really important people there. So I can say, ooh, important people, I want to be important, boom, uh, boom, I want that, right? So I think, I think that that idea of that interjected process of, like, important people giving me value, it just, it just... I mean, it's like throwing fuel on a fire in our culture. I don't think I have to go much more into that. I think people understand that. So, heard it a 12-step meeting. I never did anything good for anyone else in, unless there was someone there to see me do it. <laughs> I really thought That's people should congratulate me for taking out my own trash. <laughs> <laughs> when I got sober, I wanted an award for showing up to work every day. <laughs> These are all from my home group, so... These are actually things I've heard. So, so you can see what's missing there. Like, I need you to tell me how amazing I am. Please. I got to have it. And the guy that says, take out my own trash thing, he calls himself an army of one. You know, so, he, you know, he's thinking he's got a bravado. But meanwhile, congratulate me because I can't congratulate myself. So, both, uh, uh, a value is based on comparison. We have a culture based on, and that is supposed to be an invisible word called having. I don't know where, how it disappeared. So, culture based on having which creates a self-objectification process, which then creates low self-esteem. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So, okay. Eric Fromm, who wrote a great book in the 70s, I believe, on uh, having versus being. And this is, this is kind of, and Bill talks about this a little, a little bit in the 12 and 12, but there's this idea that materialism and having everything is just going to solve all the world's problems. Well, he starts to poke at that, say, uh-uh, no, that's a culture of having. And he starts to talk about what having does and versus being, and it's really a great book. I re highly recommend it. And, you know, Alan uses it a lot when he talks. And this is uh, the same talk from the Therapeutic Value of 12 Steps. It's available in there. And he said this, and, and this really triggered me, right? When you have a culture based on having, our relationship to ourselves becomes one of objectification. We do not experience all ourselves subjectively anymore. And we are now a commodity to be marketed. We start to relate to ourselves as an object. And we start measuring ourselves in terms of how acceptable we are out in the world. So that spun with me for probably about a year and a half, and we talked a lot in Gestalt therapy about I versus thou, and you know, it versus an it versus to an it, right? And it to an it is object object, I thou subject subject. But I really wanted to, get, and when I was preparing for this, I really wanted to get more into that. Well, what I decided to do was just to look it up, you know. So objective, and this is like I think under philosophy it gives different types of definitions. Under philosophy, relating to or existing as an object of thought <coughs> without consideration of independent existence. So I don't have an independent relationship with it. There's no consideration to my independence. I'm just taking it on. Okay, subjective. Relating to the way a person themselves experiences things in his or her own mind. So what I got out of that was this. Very unor my, if my relationship to myself is objective, it's very unoriginal. It comes through comparison. What does he look like? What do I look? How do I compare? Okay, I'm cool or I'm not. You know, um, it's unoriginal. It's non-intimate and it's totally void of uniqueness. Because how can I be unique if I'm trying to live up to some ideal? You know, with subjective, it's original, intimate, and unique. So I work with a lot of adolescents, and I really try to, you know, plant a seed on this one because there's a lot of like body images and these these things. And so one of the times I was talking to a client, and I made her aware of how you know the way she looks at herself is how she compares to all these other people that she's talking about. And I said, I want to ask you: Are you an object to be compared to? Or are you like an, Are you like a piece of art? Like, would you ever go into a museum and say, oh, that one's not as good as that one. Let's compare it. You know, you wouldn't do that. It's a piece of art. It's unique, right? 
And on some level, she got that. She was like, oh yeah, if I'm a, if I'm a piece of art, then I'm unique. And that, and that was able to kind of give her a different relationship with it. So, um, oh, another one was another client who had a similar uh, 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 issue with this. Because man, his anxiety would hammer him away about how he wasn't this and he wasn't that. And then I asked him, I said, have you ever, and we talked about you know, dating and stuff before. I said, have you ever been with a girl where you, where you connected with her? And in that moment, she wasn't five, six, this weight and brown hair and blue eyes, but all of a sudden, boom, she was real. She was a person, she was unique. She was like, it was who she was, not like data, right? And he got it. And I said, well, what if, what if you could relate to yourself that way? And that was a way of helping him understand the objective versus the subjective. So, heard it at a 12-step meeting. And man, I heard this like one of the first few meetings, and I was like, oh my god, I do this all the time. Okay, I started to compare my insides to other people's outsides. A lot of, and, and that's what I think is, to me, I think is so important in, in recovery that we hear these things to really relate to. When I get depressed, when I get anxious, when I do whatever, I start comparing my insights to other people's outsides. I'm comparing all of my anxiety, all of these tyrannical feelings that I have, and I'm looking at that guy, and he looks happy, and I'm saying, God, I'm miserable, and I'm so much more miserable than him. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we can do that all day long now. <laughs> all day long. So if I start comparing my insides to other people's outsides, I'm on my cell phone all day long going, Gina, don't know her. She's really happy. I'm miserable, you know? <laughs> you know, because the camera's in the perfect spot or whatever. And, but I just think, I think we're going to have an epidemic of this. I mean, it's just all day long I can look at people putting up some, you know, how many people are real there? It doesn't even matter if they're real if they come back to who I am. But in reality, how many people are being really who they are and trying to say, hey, this is who I am, so you can think I'm a certain way, right? So, so now we're going to get into the values and the result. And when, when my value is when I've achieved something, when I've got somewhere, when I've, when I've met that target weight, when I've gotten that job, what happens? Well, now, that's really a compulsively, remember the false self model, I'm going to be thinking about that. I'm going to have anxiety on one level. I'm going to have boredom. Talk to adolescents. If they're not doing something all the time, they're bored. I don't tell you how many times I've done little meditation exercises and the first word out of the adolescent's mouth is, that was boring. You know? <laughs> well, because they gotta be doing something to achieve something, to beat somebody, right? And of course, the deadening of the present moment. I mean, I remember in Eckhart Tolle's book, when I started reading that, he talked about the present moment being a means to an end. I got that, yeah, there's nothing here. I gotta get somewhere else, right? So. What Karen Horney says is that the neurotic becomes uninterested in the process of learning, of doing, of gaining step by step. Indeed, tends to scorn it. He does not want to climb a mountain, he wants to be on the peak. Wow, if that was... Wow, okay, we'll get to that in a second. So, so now, to me, I think this starts early on. I think this is so in our culture, so everywhere. And when I thought about this, I remembered this commercial from the early 90s. And I thought, man, if I can get a hold of it, it'd be really relevant, and I'm going to play it to you right now. A great man once said, winning, gentlemen, isn't everything. It's the only thing. <laughs> so how many of you right now went, oh, poor guy. You know, he's just trying to help these kids hey, Chris, what the kids say? What he said. What the kids say? Grass Look, a grasshopper. Oh. <laughs> Look, a grasshopper. So which one's living in a compulsive ideal and which one's totally spontaneous? <laughs> right? But the thing is, listen to the music in the background and in McDonald's, we're trying, it's like, it's crazy! It's crazy! How on earth we can tell this to kids and think it's funny and think it's, you know, it's neurotic. Scary. It's neurotic. Winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. I just think that this just goes to show you, you know. And uh, I was at one of my meetings, and one and some guy that likes to poke fun at me. I was talking about some of this stuff, and he goes, "We're gonna end the meeting, but before we end, just want to let you know, stretch uh, the first place or second place is the first loser." And uh, we went on with that. But you know, I mean, that's everywhere. And he thought it was funny. I didn't, but whatever, you know. <laughs> it's like it's just how it, it's just part of this machismo thing, right? <laughs> So what's the theme in all of these three interjections? The theme is that my value is not within me, and my value is not accessible in the moment that I'm in. So that's me about five years ago. Um, I got sober after I got laid off from a job. Actually, I got fired, um, and I, was, uh, I, I proceeded to start using drugs, uh, not just on the weekends, but you know, during the job because it was a really high-stress job, and I was really trying to make it work. 
And uh, so I ended up getting fired, and, uh, and then I just couldn't get out of my room for a few months. And this is about, a, about two weeks before I got sober, and I'm doing a video log on how I'm going to solve all my problems. And I was not sober uh, there. And um, so this was just uh, right before I, uh, I got sober. And, uh, and it was the bane of my existence, and that's really what I want to say. This was, I mean, when I all of a sudden got this clarity, I realized, oh my God. Um, I went to a meeting one time, and this, I shared, and this girl said, uh, 